How do you feel about change? Do you see it as a problem or as an opportunity? Well, that is one of the topics in today's conversation. We are meeting with Grace, who is a digital marketing manager, and she's going to share with us all about her area of expertise, her career journey, and she's got some great advice for us too. We also talk about the power of collaboration, why it's so important to trust yourself, why it's so much better to talk to people if you have worries, you're concerned, you're stuck, or you just need some help. The power of saying yes to opportunities. And of course, we talk about change. Why, if you can, you should try and embrace it because there will be opportunities for learning and growth on the other side. So if that sounds good to you, fantastic. Grace and I will see you in the show. Hello, Grace. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. All right. Well, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do and how long you've been doing it for? Um, I'm Grace Styles. I work in um, digital marketing as a digital marketing manager. However, I do have another job title, which is kind of a bit more internal, but it's um, digital lead for uh, web CMS. And I'm sure I'll get into what that actually means uh, later in the podcast. But um, yeah, so kind of my external top job title and my internal job title. Um, I've been doing this job for about eight years, but I've been working for 13 years in total um, since graduating from university. Um, and been doing something along the lines of what I do now for most of that with a little bit of a secondment that I'm sure I'll get into as well. But yeah, 30, 13 years of work, which, you know, I, I still feel like a teenager in my head. So <laughs> it seems crazy when I say that I've been working for over a decade. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about what you're doing and all of those different titles that you just talked about. Okay, great. So this is a podcast. So do you enjoy podcasts? And if so, tell us what you're enjoying right now. I listen to so many podcasts. I absolutely love them. Um, my favourite tend to be more like comedy type podcasts. I yeah. kind of like to work and kind of everything related to that tends to be on one side and then when I'm when I'm trying to relax and and that's when I would listen to a podcast it tries to, it tends to be something a bit more relaxed so comedy things things about food and drinks and that kind of stuff yeah. my favorite weirdly is one called Parenting Hell with um comedian two comedians called Rob Beckett and um Josh Widdicombe which I'm not a parent myself I'm an auntie a very proud auntie so I wonder if that's why um I like this <laughs> podcast but it's started a few years ago when um, when we were all locked up in uh, the, the pandemic time and it was just nice, easy listening, funny. And as I say, I, I am an auntie and spend a lot of time with my nephew, so I do uh, understand what they're talking about when they're talking parenting. But that's my favourite. However, I, I do have a few work-related ones that I listen yeah. to just to keep my kind of industry or, or you know, sort of be, be a bit more uh, knowledgeable uh, in the area I work in. But Generally, I do listen to podcasts just for an opportunity to relax and, and just not think about work, should we yeah. say. Oh, thank you. My sister is um, also loves that podcast and recommends I listen to it. And like you, I'm a proud auntie and um, I, it is so funny. It's hilarious. And they've got some great guests, haven't it's so they? And it's, it's just <laughs> it's more than just parenting stuff, which I think is really great. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Right. And that also helps you appreciate parents that you know and that kind of stuff do so it's good <laughs> definitely thank you and I think that's the great thing about podcasts isn't it there's something for everybody whether you want to I don't know learn about a topic or learn more about a subject matter or just chill out and you know relax and you know yeah. switch off and have a have a laugh there's something for everything everyone and I think that's great yeah exactly all right. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's move on to your area of expertise, Grace. Um, tell us about the common misconceptions of your role. What do your friends and family think you're doing all day, for example? So I work as, as I said, a digital marketing manager, web sort of CMS lead uh, in an asset management company. Not many people necessarily, and then they, unless they work in that industry, know what that means. And it is, yeah. it's financial services, it's investments, it is uh, 
investing people's money to 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 make it go further to to increase it in value um but if you don't know what those words those two words mean together it doesn't mean anything and when i say investments people are always like whoa how does she know about that why would she know about that based on her university degree or what she did at school and i mean the short answer of that is i don't actually know that much about it i think that's the first misconception that friends and family have is that i'm it's going to be some kind of financial advisor to them. And I absolutely am not. <laughs> yeah. Other than invest your money, don't just save it, leave it in cash. That's all I've got. But then the other side of it is, as I say, I'm, I work in digital marketing. Um, my my specialism is around the website. Um, social media is kind of plays part of that. And I, I'm really, apart from when it comes to for, for work-related things, I am really not generally a social media person. I use it and I, you know, look at photos that my friends have posted and that kind of stuff, but that's it. I don't post anything myself. I, you know, if anything, I I sometimes don't think it's necessarily um, the most healthy obsession for people to have. I try not to follow too many celebrities and stuff. So I think from that point of view, because it is, it does play a part of my, uh, my role, people find that surprising too. Mm. But I think the other side that um, is a bit of a misconception is um, because I work in digital and the website my dad is always just like you know nothing about computers <laughs> oh, actually that's not it hasn't got anything to do with with yeah. my day-to-day role generally I think he to start with thought I lived worked in some kind of IT support role or something yeah. could not understand that and that's based on the fact that he he has always had his career in like academia and was a lecturer at a university so not in the kind of business world at all so he really did not understand and still doesn't really what I do I think he's just like as long as she's happy and making enough money that's all that matters <laughs> <laughs> thank you I, I think so many misconceptions there and I think that's typical of so many of the roles which is hopefully why this podcast is going to be helpful for people um before we yeah, get I into agree. I think if um I was just going to say if uh, unless you think you're a teacher or a policeman or a nurse people often have no idea yeah what you do or what that entails and so I don't think I do a lot of the time either for friends and family and what they where they, what they're up to on a day-to-day basis so. <laughs> um before we do a deep dive into the role of the digital marketing manager I think it might be nice if you can kind of help us understand where digital marketing fits into a marketing department would you be able to kind of share what that might look like for us please yeah, well, it's kind of an interesting one because I think it probably depends on the industry you work on, work in. Sorry, mm. um, I work in asset management, yeah. so it's in in many ways quite old fashioned. You know, when it comes to things around um, embracing new technology, yeah, when it would come to something like marketing, certainly not you know on the product side of of what the business does, which. They've got all sorts of technology to be able to do what they do because they need to because it's managing money on behalf of other people and yeah. you know that needs to be really well protected and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to marketing, they wouldn't necessarily invest as much in the sort of technology and the, the digital side. So it's um, it's kind of I'm really sorry, I've, my, I've lost my train of thought. I can't remember what the question it's was. Fine. <laughs> It's fine. Um, I was I was curious about where digital marketing fits into um, yes, the overall in marketing department. Yeah. <laughs> so where I was going with that is uh, <laughs> so digital marketing in certain I think marketing teams would perhaps be kind of what everybody would consider their role to be yeah. because most things that we do nowadays are digital in some way. Yeah. Even if you were going into a physical shop. A lot yeah. of the time they would have a website and, and more people would use that or say social media or email marketing or, or any of those things. So um, generally, it, I think it sort of depends on the industry, whereas in asset management, say we are a little bit kind of arguably maybe behind the times when it comes to things digital related. Um, so we do sit in kind of a there's three areas that you might consider there's kind of a digital there's yeah. channel, which is the, the sort of marketing team who focus on the, the different audiences or clients or customers we have. And then there might be another kind of central function, whether that's content or design or that kind of stuff. So okay. digital kind of sit as a, a 
sort of central function within the marketing team. We're there to advise, support, collaborate with other marketing team members to be able to ensure that whatever that they, they, they feel they need to do to do their job, we can ensure that they've considered sort of the digital, digital aspect or other ways of kind of distributing information using what, however, you know, we all think yeah. it might be the best way to make it available. It could be the website, it could be social, video, podcasts, webinars, uh, virtual events, all sorts of things. Um, and a lot of time it includes many of those things all at the same yeah. time. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And and um, as well as website, what else fits within that digital team? In the digital team I work in, it is um, website, social media, something called marketing automation, which okay. in its simplest form is email marketing. So you subscribe to receive content that has been created by um, somebody else in marketing or somebody else within the business and, and that gets sent to you but it's so much more than that as well it is um how we kind of collect client data and understand our clients interests how they're using the information that we send to them or on the website or on social and then being able to personalize that so that the information they're getting is getting to them at the right time that it makes sense that it's relevant to them so it's kind of in the same way as if you see something on ASOS or, you know, it advertised to you and you then go somewhere else and, you know, see something relevant. It's not about following people and being creepy about it. It is targeting to make uh, make people aware of our brand and see things yeah. that are relevant, but also to try to help them along the way of their journey by showing them things that are meaningful to yeah. them. Oh, brilliant. Thank um, you. You know, other sort of digital marketing kind of teams might focus on. Um, oh, actually, one thing I didn't mention was analytics as well. That is fundamental yeah. to what we do because we want to be able to see how well everything we're doing is performing, how our yeah. clients, customers are engaging with it, whether it's been successful or not. If not, how potentially we can change that based on, you know, data that we've uh, that we've had from something that did work really well. So that's kind of a, a core part of, the whole of digital is is sort of learning what works well and testing and adapting things based on that. Um, so other digital teams might focus on other bits and pieces around maybe podcasting, video, um, you know, virtual events, that kind of thing. My, yeah. you know, my team do do a bit of that, but generally we outsource some of that to third parties, which is something that a lot of companies would do if you don't have the expertise in house. So with yeah. within the team, you might outsource something like that, and then we'd be there kind of more to advise or to give ideas and that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. I think what you've helped us understand there is where your your role and your team fits into digital marketing and where digital marketing might fit into the broader marketing umbrella, um, which is super helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Grace, you mentioned you're working in asset management. So would you be able to give us a high level overview of what the asset management industry is for someone that doesn't have a clue? Well, I did not have a clue when I first technically started working in asset management either. It is basically in its simplest form is investment management, managing money on behalf of other people. Yeah. So that could be as simple as me as an individual have £100 in cash that yeah. I've been saving for something. And, you know, our view on that and what has been proven time and time again is that investing that money for the sort of long term is the best way to make it increase in value if i just kept that 100 pounds in cash it will always be worth 100 pounds whereas if you invest it the value could increase yeah disclaimer that we always have to say with these things is it could also decrease in value but generally you know you hope it isn't going to do that so it's we have a what we would call kind of i guess we would call them funds but mm -hmm. products where there is a person or people who who manage that kind of fund and people invest their money into it yeah. it could invest in any number of things you know from companies like apple or microsoft or tesco sainsbury's you know any kind of company that you can think of that could be the investment yeah. approach where you invest your money in that company if that company does better and grows your money will grow as well or it could be 
investing in a property like a big shopping center or a corporate office or something like that. Could be that type of investment. It could be something called fixed income bonds. That's where you kind of invest in uh, you as a company kind of loan money to the government if they yeah. if they need it and, and then as they pay you back they pay interest on it and that makes your money increase in value or it could be a multitude of all of those things which is usually what it is it's kind of a a fund product would have many many different types of things that they're invested in to make it diverse and less risky for for the the person the person whose money who is invested in it and um and the hope that it will increase in value so that People can buy houses so they can go on holidays so they can yeah. invest for university or you know you know longer term retirement in the future and their pensions and so that's kind of the simplest form just people individuals money but then we have many different types of clients as well and that could be say a financial advisor somebody who is advising other people on what they should do and they have their clients versus a um a big large company that is investing hundreds of millions of pounds on behalf of their employees for for their personal pensions. So we have lots of different yeah. types of clients and say it could be someone's 100 pounds to 100 million pounds depending on uh, what client we're talking about. So oh, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. It's some um, it's good to help um to make it simple so that people can understand it, right? So thank you. That's wonderful. That's the only way I have to think about it as well as kind of thinking about it for me as an individual. Otherwise, when you start talking millions of pounds and hundreds of millions of pounds, it's kind of, I feel like it's a bit too too big for me to consider. Whereas if it's my money that I'm yeah. potentially investing and I do invest, you know, it, it's a lot easier to kind of try and understand yeah. <laughs> why and <laughs> why we do the job we do and why it's important and all those kind of things. Yeah, thank you. All right. So moving on to your role, if you were to say in a couple of lines what the purpose of your role is, so perhaps what your organisation rely on you for, how would you describe it? Um, so this is where probably my internal job title comes in a little bit more. So my external one being that I would use generally is digital marketing manager, but my internal one is digital lead uh, web CMS. So mm -hmm. my day to day revolves around the website, basically. Yeah. Um, we have 83 websites in total. The reason wow. for that is like most companies, there is different products that are sold in different countries and in different ways. Like a way I like to describe it is Walker's Crisps in the UK is called Walker's Crisps in Spain. It's called Lay's. There's different flavors that, <sighs> appeal to those regions yeah more than they might do you know cheese and onion for example great here probably not the flavor that would be called if you're in spain or something that's exactly what it's like for us we have different products which are more appealing or make more sense for different different countries different regions different types of audience so again whether that's me as an individual investing 100 pounds versus somebody a company investing 100 million so we have 83 websites in nine different languages. Wow. It's really quite complicated. It's highly regulated industry as well because of the nature of it. We are investing in, however, whatever client type, however much money it is at the end of the day, is always a person's money. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure we protect that. So for that reason, it's highly regulated to make sure that we do that on behalf of our clients. So the website is kind of the, the shop window if you yeah. will, you're walking past and you see a nice shop window, you want to go in there and buy something. Um, that's what our website is is trying to do. It is providing a place where all of the information about all of the different products that people can invest in through us are available. Um, but it also is somewhere that in the industry I work in, asset management, is we are legally obliged to show lots and lots of information. So... Yeah. And again, in, in the language that the people within that country speak to make sure it's really easy and, and people can understand exactly what it is they're looking at. So we, we display 26,000 documents in total on wow. our website. They need to ensure that they show in the correct location to the correct people so that we are misrepresenting ourselves in any way. But also we've got thousands of different data points to display different information. So that's things like performance so that people can go and say look the, 
you know, my hundred pounds might now be worth 150 pounds and that kind of thing. So there's um, lots of sort of regulatory reasons uh, that my job is very important and it is sort of fundamental for us to be able to do the yeah. business that we do. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of, it's, it's great and interesting and it's there to make sure that our customers and clients have all the information they need when they need it in the easiest way possible for them to, to them to find it, engage with it. That's good. But the more fun part of my job, which I like is more that kind of a marketing side of things, which is how we promote the products and, and how we, we show kind of digital website experiences that make people actually want to engage with the brand, whether that's learn what it is we do at all and, and why people maybe should invest with us um, versus also specifically around a product. So again, why why invest in, in, in this product particularly versus something else we might have on offer and why that works for you as an individual. So yeah. they're kind of the bits I enjoy most, I think, but it's kind of a multitude of marketing and brand and, and making people aware of us, what we do, what we can do for them and their money versus legal regulatory stuff which we have to show to our clients and and that's a big part of my job to be honest but um it's it's really important to make sure that people are fully aware of any sort of pros cons risks associated with them giving their money to us to to sort of try yeah. and protect and, and increase in value wow thank you so much and what does cms stand for CMS stands for Content Management System. Okay. So I'm sort of the specialist within that as a platform. In the team I work in, we uh, have we have a, a team of people, but there is then one individual who sort of specialises in a particular piece of tech. Yeah. Say so whether that is web CMS, web content management in, in my in my role, but there's there's other things that we use um, from a technology perspective that people sort of specialise and lead in. And web CMS is essentially how the website is built, the building, uh, the, the construction site that you build a website yeah. on. You can, yeah. uh, some people will build the website with, with HTML and code and all that kind of stuff. And that happens sort of elsewhere. That's not what I specialize in. Okay. I wish I was clever enough to be able to code and, and, and be a developer and all that kind of stuff. I, I basically look after the, the construction site and then there's building blocks that we can put on top of that to make it work how we need it to got it that's interesting so those twenty six thousand documents that you mentioned do they all live in the content management system yeah yes they do yeah wow um so i i've um ha learned how to build a website as part of this journey and i'm only managing um, one yeah. website <laughs> <laughs> and it's stressful enough so hats off to you managing all of those it's tough at times, very tough, but <laughs> it's also a fun part of the challenge yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to build a website in Chinese is one of those things that it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely something for a Monday morning, not a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. So Grace, tell us what you're doing on an average day, because it feels like you're doing a lot. Yeah, I don't really have an average day, I'd say, which is a good and a bad thing. I feel like there's always something that is happening that don't necessarily expect. I say that can be good and bad. I'd say on an average kind of easy day, I might build a web page to showcase a piece of thought leadership that one of our fund managers, the people who manage money on the path of our clients has 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 written uh, with a person from the marketing team and, you know, create a piece of content that that looks appealing, has got nice imagery, charts, is kind of uh, using the right keywords so that people can find it on Google, that, mm -hmm. you know, headlines that people might actually want to read if they saw it on social. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, could be part of my day. There's also 26,000 documents on our website. So some of my day would uh, be taken up with potentially uploading those, um, checking site analytics to see how well a site is performing, where it's maybe not performing so well and what potentially we can change to, to, to make sure that we're, we're giving our content on our website the best possible chance it can have to be found by clients yeah. or to be appealing because it's so competitive out there for content and, you know, with social media and everything, you know, we are we are 
basically shown so much information all the time yeah. so trying to get cut through for, for our content is quite hard and there's loads of things you can do to make sure you're making your content easier to find than others um I spend quite a lot of time looking at sort of data and and things we, we show a lot of product data on our website so it could be that it's that would be what I'd call an easy day and what I yeah. quite like sometimes my day it's be a bit more creative and 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 I've been doing it for a long time so it's kind of a bit more of a laid back day and I can be build some build some content take a look at some things see how well they're performing change a few things upload a few documents and and that's kind of a very nice easy day for me I think a more more kind of normal day a lot of the time would perhaps be something data related has um has happened on our website and it's incorrect or it's out of date and it's incorrect for a reason I don't necessarily know and so I'll have to go and try and find out what that might be or talk to different people in the business and and generally it's actually there's very little a lot of the time that I can do to solve that problem Mm. but I'll go and try and find the right person to help resolve that and say it's it is a key part of my day-to-day because we have to make sure that the information we're representing to our clients is correct and 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 not out of date because as 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 I've sort of alluded to it it's people's money that yeah. is that they're investing in ensuring that's protected and the information they receive is correct is really really important i'd say that's probably the least favorite part of my role but it does form <laughs> quite a, a large part often of my my day to day my week to week yeah but, um and it's quite challenging for me because sort of data isn't necessarily my my strong point but um the kind of general day-to-day things as well that we do that a bit more interesting would be you know i i work on quite a lot of projects so it might be at the moment i'm working on a new careers portal with our hr team and the best way to promote new jobs to people and how we can make the company look appealing as a place to work and what the benefits are and that's really um that's a nice project to work on make it look like it's on brand and yeah. you know come up with different ideas of displaying imagery and information so that's that's kind of the more fun but challenging because it's coming up with creative ways to to kind of showcase what we do um there's also sort of regulatory projects as well which is same kind of vein where it's coming up with ideas and ways to ensure that we're providing the right information to clients um i guess my role is generally quite a advisory so if there's some form of problem to solve or new initiative idea that we're kind of working on it's it's kind of my job to help plan how we might implement and and do something like that or often sort of solve a problem that needs solved it solving and that kind of problem solving bit can be fun and frustrating in the same measure so it really like my day to day is kind of can be it changes all the time but sometimes I like to have an easy day and sometimes it's yeah I like to have a bit of a more challenging day <laughs> yeah absolutely and I think that as you as you mentioned this is a highly regulated industry so you can't just kind of write anything on the website and and no. I guess that is in your role as advisor I guess that's um going to be important for you to be able to express that to yeah. the 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 the, th- the thought leaders who are writing the content right and I guess that's something you have to kind of keep a real eye on to make sure that it's yeah you know, there's, there's- lots of layers of kind of um uh, before something can become available on our website there's many many layers of kind of reviews and approvals and that kind of thing before it can get there and you say it's um also ensuring that people are aware of any constraints that there might be when it comes to the website if they want to do something in a certain way or if it's there is a constraint again how how potentially we can overcome it whether that is finding some money and budget to to do that or resource to help with it or is it working with someone to develop something brand new that we can you know a component a way of showing information on the website to make sure that we're we're able to uh, resolve that issue in the in the best the, the best way so yeah yeah okay thanks and and I'm just really curious about the the point you made about let's say there's something wrong with a piece of data you know how would it work because because presumably you then don't have to 
I guess, go through every single website to fix that piece of data? Is there something on the back end that kind of, I guess, uh, controls what we we as the user would see on the front end? Yeah, so there's a, within the web CMS that we use, there's kind of the, the area which is where the actual content on pages sits and, you know, yeah. we put some words on a page, imagery, all that kind of stuff. And then there is this other part, which is where all of the 26,000 documents sit, our metadata and information to ensure that displays in the right place. And then there's yeah. another area, which is the data. And it is, there's a lot of it. I actually don't know how many pieces of data feeds into it. A hell of a lot is all I know, but it's, yeah. that's where I would go to check yeah. whether or not and, and how, uh, how we might solve this issue and who I might need to go to to yeah. help resolve it. Um, again, that kind of is something hasn't fed through from some other system upstream or downstream and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, uh, has it even arrived in our web CMS for it to display on the website? Yeah. Has it pulled through incorrectly? Has it somehow has a, something been set to the wrong status or to the wrong country and region? And so there's, there's a lot of information called metadata, which is, is essentially information to ensure that things display where they need to, how they need to, and in the correct yeah. way. And I can go and make sure that all of those things look as I expect them to first yeah. before then going and finding the root cause and, and going around and asking people, is this you, yeah. is this you sometimes? Or, you know, sometimes knowing exactly who we need to go to. But yeah, yeah it's um, it's often a bit of a basically exploration for me, yeah. and going and investigating why. And say yeah. it's definitely not my um, strong suit because it's often a very uh, industry specific information that I, I work in digital marketing. I, I know enough about uh, the products and the, the company and the funds and things that we run to be able to do my job and do yeah. it well. But I'm certainly not an expert in that area. Like the people who are running the funds wouldn't know how to do my job. I don't know how to do that. So that to me is, yeah. is often quite a challenge to kind of work out some of these things. And my industry, like many, is so full of jargon. Everybody uses the same terms to mean the same thing. They'll have 10 different ways to describe something when we could just have one, but sometimes it means you do have to, it's like people speaking in French to me. So <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit of a challenge. So lots of pro problem solving. And then I guess when you figure it out, yes. make the change and then hopefully it filters through to all of the right places. Yeah. Let's, let's say the data side of things, my least favorite type of problem solving. I do a lot of fun problem solving too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what about those things that happen less frequently throughout the year that you really enjoy or that we should know about? Um, less frequently would be things like big campaigns. So something like a brand campaign. So how we ensure that when people are thinking about investing their money that they decide to come to us rather than yeah. someone else. Or again, it could be a, a product fund related campaign to ensure that if people have already made that decision potentially to invest with us they pick a product which is is right for them they're the things that i really enjoy they don't tend to come as frequently as your day-to-day -day. you know it often involves many team members many different parts of the business money and all those kind of things but they're the parts of, of my role i really enjoy because that's yeah. where the fun problem solving comes in and the fun advice and creative ideas and all that kind of thing and it, it's where you get to work collaboratively with loads of different people who do different types of jobs and it, it's yeah. always really fun working together to come up with something that everybody tends to be proud of and are pleased to be a part of and then when you see it come to fruition it, it's always really nice and even after something is launched there's always more that's involved it never just launches and that's it there's always additional things that happen more content that's created to support that as a campaign or you know events that happen and all that kind of thing and again working digital we're all about kind of the the analytics and how well things mm -hmm. are performing so testing things like that and adapting and making changes to ensure that things are working and working in the way that we want them to and so it's it's always a fun thing to, yeah. to be part of i guess the other thing I really like that is not as frequent, but we often do quite big events. Yeah. Um, 
where again it's working with with lots of different types of people but there could be a virtual aspect where it's recorded there could be sort of a registration microsites things that happen that uh, mean that we we make it a whole um a digital only kind of registration process and they're, they're not as frequent but again there's always so much that so much new sort of things happening within digital that you can kind of test and use and and try out and it's always fun to be able to have a go at doing things like that and advise them to advise our sort of different marketing team members that they might like to might like to try something like this it's where we get to be a bit more innovative and creative so it's always fun oh that's great thank you and I'm going to ask you about um, the future of digital marketing a bit later but I'm guessing you're always at the forefront of the new things and you know, we, we keep hearing about AI and the yeah. metaverse and this new chat GPT thing. And I guess those are all things that you kind of need to be across in your role. Yeah, we do. And it's hard because there's always something new. Yeah. And I think that's where kind of working in asset management is good and bad. So we're sort of relatively lucky because we probably almost tend to be a little bit behind the curve with things like that. So we can perhaps see where people have tried and perhaps not done such a good job of it. I don't want to say fail because that sounds horrible, but tried and, and and maybe needed to adapt and we can maybe learn from that. Yeah. However, it also does mean that we're maybe not always as much on the forefront as you might like to be. It say it's I work for a really big company as well. So the ability to sort of use new technology sometimes takes a bit longer to, to filter through and we have to ensure that everything goes through quite a lot of layers of, of due diligence to, to ensure that the, the technology is safe and, and there's no way that we could be um, under any kind of threat from some kind of cyber attack or anything yeah. like that. And again, those things are so important. Yeah. But it does mean we tend to have a little bit more time to learn and understand what all the, the new potential kind of uh, sort of initiatives, exciting AI bots, all that kind of stuff is before we start using it. But you definitely need to know about it because if somebody comes to you and tells you something that you don't know, sometimes that can be quite embarrassing. That's yeah. where there's loads of uh, that is where I would uh, use a lot of uh, in uh, digital marketing podcasts to try and broaden my knowledge on that. And there's loads of different sites that I would I'd go on to kind of make sure that I'm aware and events and those kind of things. But yeah, you do really need to be at the forefront of what is going on yeah. and say that's really great, but also sometimes a bit scary because we yeah. just don't know where yeah. it's going to go and I just hope I'll I'll always have a job because who knows yeah robots could take over and I'll no longer be needed <laughs> hopefully not hopefully not um you mentioned web C- <laughs> you mentioned web cms are there any other tools or specialist programs that you use that the audience might like to be aware of yeah, we use a lot. So we are we use a, a web CMS called um, WordPress, which is a really common one. Lots of people, you know, who who manage websites will be aware of WordPress. We use a, a, a specific version of it, which ensures it, it's it's very secure and all yeah. that kind of thing. But it, it's it's very similar to to other versions. There's many other CMSs that that people use um, that can do all sorts of different things. Lots of really cool things as well. Um, but we also use um, Adobe Analytics. That's really similar to Google Analytics, but um, we, we've we've decided as a company that's that's the platform we're going to use, and we use that so that we can understand how our website users are engaging with our yeah. website, um, how their their behaviour when they get there, how they've got there, have they come via Google, have they come via, via an advert, social media all that kind of information. We can also ensure that our website is um, tagged so that when people are on it, we understand exactly how they are using it so that we can ensure that that kind of experience is as seamless and easy for them as possible. Yeah. Or from a kind of marketing perspective, that if there's something we really want them to be to, to see, we can ensure that that is happening. And if it's not, kind of test different locations, different ways for it to, yeah. to be made available so that, people actually do see the things that we think they might like to see. Um, we use um, a, a platform called Salesforce, which is a 
client relationship management tool. That's yeah. where all of our different client data sits. So we know who some of those people are, what they're invested in, what their interests are. And we can then use that information to help provide them information that will be of interest to them. Yeah. Or, you know, people who work in our sales team can contact them and, and speak about things that, you know, they, that might be relevant. Um, we have a email marketing automation tool, which is also a Salesforce product called Marketing Cloud. Um, it, again, is is a bit of a, a, a data center of, of all sorts of information about our clients and their preferences and all that kind of thing. But it's also the simplest way to describe it is a way of yeah. sending emails to people. And it could yeah. all be automated so that you set up an email and it goes to a group of people there's another email that goes to a different group of people based on their interests if they don't open it and you really really need them to for some reason perhaps it's a regulation that they need to be aware of you can auto resend if people haven't opened it is that because it was a really boring email maybe perhaps we need to change the subject line you know if people have clicked on that email where they have gone how they've engaged with our, our website or wherever else we've decided to direct them to so that's another big one we use. We then also have podcast technology, video sort of hosting platforms. We have um, a location where we store lots of marketing kind of documentation. Again, asset management can be a bit old school at times. We we have a lot of PDFs that have lots of information on, which I think quite a lot of industries probably would not necessarily use, but. Um, we've got a, a tool where we can see how people are engaging with that content. So yeah. how many times has it been downloaded? How many times has it been sent to a client? Who is who's, who's allowed to see that information based on where they are in the world? And it really helps us to get a good understanding of how our content is being engaged with as well. So whether it's necessarily yeah. worth doing, only two people have looked at it, maybe we don't bother with this anymore or we focus yeah. on something else. So technology and um, sort of mar- marketing technology martech is like a big part of um, a digital marketing team's role and trying to ensure that you've got the right technology to do the job you need it to do is really important and a key thing that we're always trying to do is get technology that complements each other and yeah. often integrates with each other mm-hmm. so everything then any kind of uh, learnings you have or, or or sort of analytics you can get about our clients or the way things are being engaged with if those those kind of uh, those bits of technology complement each other and can be connected it means that you've got kind of a really clever brain which has got yeah. lots of different parts which then can spit out something which will say right this is how something has performed across social email website the document sort of hosting repository, video, podcast, you know, it's, it's, if those things can all connect, you can, yeah. you can do some really smart things and get really good insight into how people are engaging with all the things that we're doing from a digital perspective. Oh, thank you. It's fantastic, isn't it? Because you're not just putting out something blindly like we might have done in the past. If you sent a, I don't know, a, a newsletter or even I'm just thinking a very old school, but like a, you know, a hard copy mail out, for example, it, it, with the MarTech, you can kind of test the the results of that. Um, and, uh, as, and, and like yeah, you say, you can, can get always... better and pivot and yeah. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're always trying to do is to test and learn and make sure that what we do every time gets the results. And it, of course, doesn't it doesn't get the results every time. But at least we can then try and work out why that might have been and try and get better next time. And yeah, so it is it's all about trying to get our information to the right people at the right time so that they actually are interested in it and try our best not to kind of blindly just pushing information to people who potentially aren't interested in it because that's yeah. a good way to kind of annoy people yeah yeah all right thank you so grace tell us what you love about your role i like working in digital because i do think it is the most exciting part of marketing especially yeah. when you're thinking of future as well because it's only going to 
only going to become more important. It's already fundamental, but it's going to become more so. So I always think it's exciting. And so I think it's always seen as kind of the maybe nerdy, but ge- uh, nerdy, geeky, but also cool part of marketing yeah. to work on. Um, nerdy because it's a lot of sometimes it's like analytics and you say you work with developers on the website side of things and you need to be a bit techy sometimes and but it is it is the yeah the the cooler side of things knowing that you're working on the social media or the the website or a video and, and ensuring that that's you know produced in a way that will really work and is got cool animation or any of those things so yeah. it is definitely the the part of marketing I would have always wanted to work in um but the bit that I I, I always like working across teams uh, on things that involve everybody else I enjoy working collaboratively on bigger things most you know that's that's the thing I like to do most in my my job to say taking an idea and running with it and coming up with something that at the end of uh, at the end of it everybody's really proud of and is looks good and uh you know it's got lots of different elements to it and we've all worked together to get there um yeah I think it's always that, that's my, my favorite part of my role I was like working with different people and yeah yeah I think it's always shows the importance of people's different skill sets and and yeah. why very rarely if you're doing something on your own will the result be better than if you were to do it as part yeah. of a bigger team so that's what I like oh thank you what about the most challenging parts of your role <sighs> most challenging is getting people to understand that just because they would like something to be on the website now doesn't mean it can happen there's so many things that might potentially need to happen before you get it there, whether that's reviewing and approvals and all that kind of stuff. But even once you're through that, there is, it's not always that easy to make things look exactly how people might envisage them. And we, we produce in, in, in asset management, there's a lot of PDFs often say lots of people still do engage with PDFs in, in this industry and you can basically make them look as amazing as you like you can have amazing imagery charts they can be animated they can do all sorts of things but actually when it comes to the website it isn't always as easy to do that especially working on a cms there's often constraints for good reason that is for brand consistency to make sure it's really clear that that whatever it is that you're creating is is on brand but also you can't just create an animation out of nowhere it's That involves code and HTML changes and developers and all that kind of stuff. So it's sometimes quite challenging just to be like, I know this looks amazing here, but when it gets to be on the website, we we are constrained in certain ways unless you've got lots of money to spend potentially or a bit more time. It's it's never necessarily a super quick thing, but also you have to be aware of um, there's lots of limitations, again, in a good way of of Mm. doing things on a website. So you we don't as a a company have a mobile app version of our website and that's because we have a we have mobile apps to be able to go and actually invest your money and 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 get your 100 pounds and make an investment and see how it's performed but all of the content that's available on our website isn't available by a a mobile app so we need to make sure that all the content on our site looks as good as it does on your laptop PC as it does when you look at it on your iPad or your iPhone and all those things take time and testing there's also lots of things around accessibility which is super important and something that I feel really passionately and strong about strongly about that you need to make sure that this content is accessible to everybody if they have some form of um, disability which means that if somebody's blind and they can't see the content on your website, you need to build the content in a way that if they were using a screen reader, that they have as close to a person who isn't, you know, doesn't, isn't partially sighted, you know, the experience that we have, you know, so it's just really important to make sure you get all that stuff right because it otherwise will have a sort of negative impact on some of our users. So it's just challenging for people to, it's not always a quick thing just because they want it there today or yesterday yeah. doesn't necessarily mean we can. And so we have 83 websites. So sometimes it's, there's a lot of work to do a lot of the time and getting people to 
sort of realise that is 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 quite the challenge. <laughs> I'm I'm just imagining um, colleagues and um, saying to you, "Oh, well, can't you just do that? Can't, can't you quickly just do that?" And you're like, "Yeah, it's always if, can't if you only, just quickly." If only. And sometimes I can. Yeah, sometimes I can just quickly, but so also sometimes. Well, I can just quickly, but I've got. 50 other things on my list to do and they got here before yours so I could but that might distract me from all the other things I need to do so yeah. it's, it's kind of prioritizing and making people understand why perhaps what they want and need isn't necessarily as high a priority because everyone wants their things to be done first and I totally appreciate it because I would too but you yeah. can't always do it, unfortunately <laughs> Um, obviously I'm not expecting you to share anything confidential, but Grace, could you just share with us, you know, you, a proud moment, um, from your experience in digital marketing management, you know, when you, when you think of, you know, things you're really proud of, what springs to mind? Um, I have worked on quite a lot of big projects during my career. And I think, most of them have been very challenging in their own way but I think it's always once it comes to an end and you see what you've achieved it's always a proud moment but yeah last year I um had a, it was a hard year probably one of my most difficult actually in my whole career but we needed to relaunch all 83 of the websites that 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 we help that we have um it was a very small team working on it for many different circumstances and it was a hell of a job. And it was yeah. um, the, the biggest challenge I've had in my career as well. Yeah. Most trying time. I had to cry a few times. Um, I laughed a lot as well. But it was, uh, the, do you know what, actually, budget-wise, for very rarely, we had enough budget. We didn't have enough time. We didn't have enough resource. And not necessarily enough people who knew a lot of history that we needed. So it was it was really difficult. But we launched all 83 websites at the time that we said we were going to, you know, within the scope of the the, the project as we we planned it. And it was just such when it launched, it was just such a proud moment for me because say it had been such a challenge. It had been yeah. really trying. But as I say, fun as well. I worked with a really great group of people on it. We had so much fun as well as having a really tough time. And it just, when you see something come to uh, fruition and it's it's done and in the way you wanted it to be done, it's always a really proud moment. Yeah. But say it could be something much smaller than that as well. I think yeah. I like seeing things from start to finish and, and when it's people are happy with the outcome and you are and it's it's met some form of objective either from the sort of wider business or you as an individual, I always feel pretty proud in those moments. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing. You wouldn't believe that. actually how difficult it sometimes is just seeing something from start to finish and actually it completing because there's yeah. so many things that happen when you're you know working every day that can can stop that happening. So it is always really nice. Yeah, yeah. And just touching on that because you did say it's been it was a challenging year. If you had to go back and do that year again, you know, now with that hindsight and with those learnings, would you do anything differently? Yeah, I would do a lot of things differently. I think um, I've learned so much, and that's the, that's always the good thing about yeah. challenges and trying times is you always learn something from it. I think what I learned is to trust myself a little bit more. Yeah, I always uh, my natural state is imposter syndrome, and that well, I'm probably wrong, and it's not a good place to be because generally there's a reason why I'm paid to do the job I yeah. do. But I've always got a bit of, oh, maybe I tricked them somehow. And maybe they, maybe I I don't know what I'm talking about. But generally, you know, it, it, we actually had an intern in a few weeks ago and I, I spent a lot of time with her. And, and it's times like that when you realize, oh, no, I do know what I'm talking about. I do know yeah. a lot. But I always, um, I always assume, assume that I might be wrong before I assume I'm right. So I think it's uh, the thing I've learned is generally if, if somebody has hired you to do a job and you've, you've, you know, got there and people trust you to do it, you probably yeah. do know what you're talking about. So trust trust your judgment. And yeah, you always, most of the time, unless you become the CEO of a company, and even then you can have mentors and other people that you can kind of go to. But just talking things through with people rather than keeping it in is something I learned because I kind of took a lot on my own shoulders and then realised that there's all these other people who I can ask advice for and they'll yeah. probably tell me, yeah, go for it. That seems right to me. 
yeah thank you so trust yourself and make sure you're talking to other people yeah okay thank you all right grace let's go all the way back to the beginning when you were young you know at, at school what did you want to be when you grew up I wanted to be a TV chef when I was young and it is so ironic now because I don't really cook to be honest <laughs> um, I will eat toast and eggs and get takeaways I'm I'm very lazy when it comes to cooking <laughs> um, and I really don't like having photographs taken of myself I don't like necessarily hearing my voice this recording a podcast isn't something that I, I would usually try to avoid or if somebody says do you want to do you want to be on a panel and we'll put absolutely not so they're kind of I don't like seeing myself on screen I don't like hearing my voice when it's recorded I don't really like having my photo taken so it's so strange that that was what I wanted to do and uh but I really did I was you know yeah. that was I thought I wanted to be a tv chef <laughs> <laughs> what inspired it at I the did, time when I was a kid like I did like cooking when I was a child and I liked doing it with my mum and baking cakes and that kind of thing. And I think I like the idea of making a bit more money from it than if you were just, just a chef in a restaurant, I guess was, was where that TV side of it came out. I do think it was the, you probably a bit richer. (laughs) That's a terrible (laughs) thing to think as well. Cause I don't think I'm particularly feel that way now. I'd rather, you know, I'd quite, we'd quite like a nice and easy life. (laughs) (laughs) So once, um, I, I guess, what age did that dream, I guess, uh, fizzle out and new dreams come in? Probably when I was a teenager, when you might have actually started thinking about what you might like to do. Yeah. And then I, I wanted to be a speech and language therapist because because my twin brother had, uh, when he was, when he was uh, young, had... Um, he didn't learn to talk until he was a bit older. So yeah. I, I sort of thought that might be something I was interested in doing. But then that went out the window and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. All I knew I, um, I wanted to do something I hoped I enjoyed. I wanted to go to university and have a fun time. I really didn't know. I yeah. just existed. Yeah. I did quite well in school and all those kind of things at university. But I had no idea. I really yeah. didn't know what was out there either yeah. necessarily. Yeah. So it wasn't being a teacher or a nurse, a firefighter, any of those things. I, I didn't really know what people who worked in companies did. Yeah. And were you talking to anyone around about careers at the time? Not really. Yeah. I think we had career sessions and there were people who came in to talk to us about it. But again, it meant absolutely nothing to me. And again, that, that could have been because most people who I knew who were close enough to me that I would understand anything about what they did, aunties, uncles, parents, they all did tend to work in the NHS of some sort or some kind of academic or teaching profession. So it always is a bit more meaningful then because you've been to school, so you know what the teacher does or, you know, you've been to the doctor, so you know what a doctor does. So I really didn't really understand what people were talking about. Yeah. So how did you decide what to do at A-level and then uni? I decided by what I enjoyed, which I think is a good thing and a bad thing. I mean, luckily, I think what I enjoyed was also what I was good at, which I think is my personality that if I don't enjoy something, if I'm not good at something, I probably won't enjoy it as much. So I just did what I enjoyed which I think has yeah. served me served me yeah. well based on the fact I didn't know what I wanted to do I think if you know yeah. what you want to do then you would nest you would need to potentially choose subjects that help you get to that point because I didn't really know I chose subjects I enjoyed and it's worked out okay I think one of the things that people don't always realize is um that for a lot of jobs it actually doesn't matter what subject you do yeah. As long as, you know, you, there's so many other things that are more important. So I think enjoyment and, and being able to, you know, do well at a subject also it ha- helps with that enjoyment, I think, is, is, is important. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think in the absence of a plan, 
I think choosing what you enjoy is really sensible because if you enjoy it, you're more likely to dedicate time to learning about the subject matter. So, uh, you know, ultimately that will help you, you know, do well in that area. Um, what yeah. did you do at uni? I did sociology, which yeah. has not got any kind of a, it doesn't help me with my day-to-day -day role at all, other than the fact that I think it's, it's, an interesting subject because learning about how society works and the yeah. reason why things perhaps happen in the way they do or from a historical perspective or from different cultures and the way things work in different countries and say again historically that is is quite a good foundation for yeah. understanding how people work and groups of people work but for what I actually do I learned it yeah when I started doing it yeah yeah so but tell I, us I, li I liked it and it was also quite of a dossy course people might say <laughs> you had to do a lot of self-learning you weren't in university that much I, I I very much enjoyed my time at university but um I don't other than having a degree at the end of it it, it hasn't really had any kind of impact on the job that I ended up yeah. doing but I wouldn't change it and and having a degree for certain jobs unfortunately is currently the only way to yeah. to be able to do it I don't think that's right either because some people just aren't necessarily um, uh, suited to university, but they would yeah. more than certainly do an amazing job working and doing any role, the job, the role I'm doing. But unfortunately, that is often how things are set up currently. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So tell us about the transition from uni to work. What did that look like for you? I've always been quite a hard worker. I've always had, I've had a job since I was 13 working in a shop. I then yeah. worked in restaurants and hotels and all that kind of thing. So I've always been a hard worker. So I think that's helped me when it came to the transition to work. But I did go traveling for six months yeah. in between. I think that really helped too. <laughs> um, having a bit of a break from learning and education and then, um, and then going and trying to find a job. But I think having a good work ethic helped me. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's a hindrance as well because I think I'm a bit of a I want to work until something is done and perfect and as good as I can possibly be and sometimes I work myself too hard to get to that but um, it's also it, it's, it is a good thing ultimately you know a good work ethic will be you're likely to achieve what you want to but yeah it was a weird transition especially as I say I, I kind of I moved to London not having yeah. a clue what I wanted to do yeah, I, I took an internship um, because my sister's flatmate worked at a company. So I went and just took an internship. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't really know what they did. Yeah. Um, but it then all kind of just went from there. The, the, the job I currently do now was I work for the same person I started working with all those wow. years ago and have we've gone our separate ways for a while and then come back together. So again, I think that kind of work ethic is something that is really important because you just never know when people you meet in one sort of job role might come back around and say, potentially offer you a job, which is what's happened yeah. to me, which is super lucky, but also who might, they might go to somebody for recommendations, see that you've worked with somebody that you know, somebody and, you know, could go and ask, you know, would you recommend this person? So I think it, it's, yeah it's yeah. A, a, a good trait to have being hard working <laughs> yeah so tell us about that internship what what kind of industry what kind of company and what were you doing it was dig a digital marketing agency but yeah. it was for all different types of clients then yeah. it was I worked for channel four mars some like telecoms companies all sorts of kind of a bit more um companies you might know and have heard yeah. of basically and you might actually understand what they do immediately because yeah. they're companies that you as a as a person from whatever age or wherever whatever background or whatever you actually um you actually use engage yeah. with so um it was it was digital marketing so that's yeah. where it all kind of began but then I, I moved into a, a role which was a bit more kind of social media orientated and the yeah. clients that they had were all asset managers. So that's how my career in asset management started. 
it was completely by chance. I had to say no idea what it meant. I didn't have a clue what was going on most of the time during that period. But I think I I showed willing and I was willing to learn and say work yeah. hard and show initiative and all those kind of things. So now this yeah. is the industry I work in and I'm pretty much always have in some form, say I took a little detour into pensions for a while, but yeah. for all intents and purposes, it's very, very similar. So yeah, yeah it was completely by chance that I ended up where I am. <laughs> um, so when you were in that internship and then, and then you moved to the next role, you know, what was going through your head um, when you realised, ah, you know, I think I like this. I think maybe I could make a career of, of this. You know, tell us about those, you know, that time. Um, I think, again, it's being proactive and taking any opportunity that comes your way. As I say, I took that opportunity to go and work in that team with those yeah. type of clients, again, not knowing really what it meant but the social media side of thing was what appealed to me to yeah. start with um I understood what that meant so therefore that must be a good thing and and I say then the, the sort of asset management part came in time and I say I now work in a company doing that as that that's what the company does um but I think I just took any opportunity as it came and yeah. tried my best tried to learn and again as I saw myself learning more, it became more enjoyable. Yeah. And challenges, sometimes good, sometimes bad. But I don't, it just kind of happened because I just took the opportunities as they came. I do think I'm very lucky in certain respects to say I, I managed to get this internship because of, of a friend. And, and, and those are, it is really hard because if you don't have an opportunity like that, you know, it, yeah. how do you sort of get the in? But, you know, I always think if you talk to people, ask people, anybody you know, I'm sure everybody's, most people are willing to help. Yeah. And most people remember what it was like for them trying to get their first role. So would always want to kind of go out of their way to try and uh, make an opportunity for somebody. Say I had an intern in my team for a few days um, just a couple of weeks ago. And, yeah. you know, it's actually a lot of work for you to have yeah. somebody in your team as an intern because it takes a lot of time and support and you need to give them a lot of guidance but I wouldn't not do it because yeah. I just think it's so helpful for them to either learn that they absolutely don't want to do what we do or that maybe it will be of interest and I think most people would feel the same as me that they they would yeah. like to give that opportunity to people but I think it's just take opportunities as they come and hopefully and I'm sure it will it will always end up leading to something that feels like it's becoming a career and if it's not potentially you know, take, yeah. an, take another one. I did a secondment in um, the design team of a company I worked for to one previous to where I work now. I'm not particularly kind of design orientated. Mm. Like I couldn't use any of the tools that they use, but they were willing to train me and give me guidance. Yeah. So I wasn't particularly good at it. I did it for a year and I learned so much and it actually really helps me now with my job as well. Because one thing I understand how a different team work and how that yeah. relates to what I do. But also, because sort of I work really closely with the design team, I now know how they need me to work to make yeah. their lives easier and to make mine because we speak a bit more of the same language. So I just always say any opportunity that arises, take it. You, if you don't like it, you will definitely learn something. Yeah, absolutely. Say yes to opportunities is the is yeah. what I'm hearing here. <laughs> so after the... you you um, left the agency and moved into asset management and now you're working in the social media team. What happens after that? I then, unfortunately, after my first role, that little sort of business unit within this agency shut down and we all got made redundant, essentially. Yeah. But it was, and, and I'd only been working at that point for two years and I was I was yeah. so, I was devastated at the yeah. time. Um, and I mean, it was a thing to be really upset about. It was a big thing. I yeah. had to go and find a new job. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But that's when it was just like, right, okay, I've got this asset management experience. Perhaps I'll yeah. go and work in, in house somewhere. And that's what I did. And it was actually, again, I think needing the money was what drove me there, which isn't a 
good or bad driver yeah. that's kind of life a lot of the time but I ended up um taking a role in more of a administrative sort of project related role yeah in a pensions manager so very similar industry but what I realized from that is that I absolutely hated being always the person who was dictated to yeah but that's some people that will work so well that they like to be able to be told how they need to do their job and do it on a day-to-day and it works great and yeah I also sometimes think I would love that again now after kind of having to be the person making decisions or be accountable for things I do sometimes really crave that kind of oh it'd be really lovely just to be told how to do things or what I needed to do but I know I wouldn't necessarily like that for very long so I I learned that that kind of administrative side of things wasn't for me but in that role I learned loads about the industry yeah and how it actually worked I worked as part of the investment team so sort of on the way other side to marketing yeah and so I didn't understand a lot of it but I learned more than I probably would have done had I not done it um but it then also then drove me to I don't want to do this I want to do marketing marketing is the side of this particularly digital that I enjoy and therefore I wanted to get another job and that's when the person who I worked with at the digital marketing agency contacted me I've been looking for a new job for a really long time I actually tried to get out of asset management a little bit as well thinking well maybe working in marketing in a different type of company would be fun too but yeah a previous colleague got in touch and said that I've got this role in my team would you like to would you yeah. like to apply for it and I did and 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 then that's where it kind of yeah. my role as it stands now sort of really began I went and joined the company where they were building up a digital marketing team so this was yeah. 2014 yeah didn't necessarily really exist in asset management at that time and yeah people did a little bit on the side of their desks but to actually build a, a team who specialized in that and so I was the first hire after the sort yeah. of senior lead to come in and and start kind of taking on that role so yeah great so now you're back in asset management in a newly formed digital media team so tell us about um you know tell us about that tr- transition in that role and then on to the next one it was really hard because people sort of felt like we were taking some of their part of their job yeah because it was a lot of people had already been doing some of the things that we we're going to be doing very quickly i think they realized that it was it wasn't taking their role they yeah. could still be involved and we still really needed them yeah to advise and help and you know, support us as well but that if you had a team dedicated to it the result is probably going to be better because yeah. that's what they're focusing on that's what they're uh, being trained to do in my case you know I wasn't necessarily knew exactly what I was doing but that's what I was learning to do and you know finding out all the information I needed to so I think that was um the, a tricky part of it but back then it say it was a, it was kind of a new team people didn't really know what it meant people didn't really know what we did and yeah. back then it was just the website there wasn't yeah. really anything else that we were involved in and then as time went on it was much more about the analytics side of things and how the website was performing. And then I got involved in uh, the video production side of things and ensuring that the the content looked good and that it was compliant and working with video agencies to to film people and or come up with animations. It was then again, podcasts and eventually social media and and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of built from there, but very much the website to start with. And I did have a bit more of a, a sort of, a bit more of a scope for a role then which I also think is really beneficial particularly I think when you're younger to have a role potentially that involves you in lots of different things because then you can kind of decide what you like and the website was always a thing that I um understood the best and kind of liked to do and kind of was always the thing that was uh, I was best at essentially yeah. and therefore that's why my career has led to sort of being uh, that's been my special specialism but yeah so I still do like to have my opinion on all the other things as well yeah <laughs> share I, I like to share my opinion with everybody about things that I um have done in the past and then sometimes it's helpful I'm sure sometimes people think it's not 
<laughs> no, but I think that's it. Idea sharing is so important. And it sounds as though it was in this role where you really felt that, you know, this was your area of expertise, digital marketing, yeah. the website in asset management. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so then when you transitioned out of this role into the next role, what, what was, uh, you know, what was the, your title here at this point and what did you go on to do? I was a digital marketing executive, yeah. which sounds a lot fancier than it is when you hear executive because you hear chief, you know, chief executive and all that kind of stuff. But that basically means they're kind of a, a junior role within marketing. I then was um, promoted to senior marketing executive. Yeah. Um, during that time, I worked at this old, uh, other company for um, six years. I then was promoted. I then did my secondment in the design team oh, where I went yes. back down to the most yeah. junior role. I had no idea what I was doing. I then, uh, an opportunity came up to take on the manager role within digital, but specifically on the website at the company I was working at. I've been doing my secondment for a year. I'd really enjoyed it. I'd learned a lot, but it definitely wasn't where I could see myself progressing, particularly. Yeah. Um, so it definitely wasn't going to become, uh, I definitely wasn't the best designer, wasn't even close to being a designer. You know, I didn't have the best ideas. Like I just, I didn't really know what I was doing. But um, so I, I applied for this sort of manager role in the yeah. company and um, got it. And that's where I kind of became a digital marketing manager, but again, with the specialism uh, yeah. website. And yeah. I did that um, there for maybe 18 months. Yeah. And it was really great. It was really helpful. But I just felt like I had kind of a, uh, I was getting a little bit, I don't want to say bored because that sounds bad, but wasn't necessarily enjoying the company I was working for as much I was getting finding myself getting frustrated with certain things and I was I was ready for a fresh challenge yeah which is when I decided to move to the to the I say company I work for now because I actually it, it's two companies that have come together so yeah. I've worked at one that uh, it was acquired by another so it's the same role with many of the same team members yeah but it is actually a new company for me I've only and you've been working there for sort of a shorter period of time, but that was a. It, it's very similar and very different all yeah. all at the same time due to due to the acquisition and a merger of two companies, which is something that is a challenge all of its own. <laughs> <laughs> I think what's really nice there is when you told us about that design secondment. Um, really brave to try something completely new and out of your um, comfort zone, but and I think it does take bravery to try something like that. But you did, and I think what's really nice about it is you you listened to how you were feeling about it, and even though you enjoyed the experience, you knew it wasn't going to be for you long term, and so you were you know again brave to kind of. Um, you know transition back to what you did know and love and and I also think that yeah. what you what you said about um you know once you'd experienced 18 months in the previous organization you again you listened and you knew you were ready for something more um a, a new challenge and I think that is that's important again just to listen um and you know listen because because it tend you tend to know in your gut um, if something is or isn't right, and I think that it, one thing is listening, but the other thing is actually taking action. And I think that when we do listen and take action, that's when we we do have um, you know fulfilling and happy careers. It's often when we don't take the action that we do become a bit stale and unhappy, and so on. Yeah, and I think the other thing would say I I completely agree, and I think. The key thing is about being ready. I think it's it's sometimes great to just jump in, dive in head first, and it will almost certainly work out great. And again, if it doesn't, you have probably learned something that you yeah. like or don't like or where a company ethos and culture you don't like, and therefore next time you might do something differently. But I do also think sometimes it's quite – we're always, as I think – humans are always so concerned about progressing all the time and sometimes it's quite nice and that's how what I'm trying to do at the moment actually is stand still for a little yeah. while to be like okay just exist and try and do yeah. what you're doing really well and you know it's it's really great to progress it's really great to challenge yourself but I think sometimes if depending on what else is going on in your life or anything else you've kind of 
that might be concerning to you or, or might mean that taking that jump, perhaps it wouldn't be the right time. Sometimes it is okay to let yourself just yeah stand still. And I think we often don't necessarily do that. So I think it's never going to be a bad thing, I don't think, to jump in head first, but I don't think there's anything wrong with sometimes just taking yeah. a breath and thinking, am I ready for this? Or is this the right time? Because I think sometimes it, it say, I, I'm talking about personal experience right now. I think it's quite yeah. nice sometimes to... Yeah. yeah. I think I think you're what totally you right <laughs> because sometimes I feel like the decision is often shall I or shan't I but there is a third option which is I don't know let's just wait for a bit and see yeah yeah okay thank and opportunities you opportunities will almost certainly always come up if you're you're willing to look out for them or open yeah. to them yeah. or ask people say yeah. chat to people ask them if does anybody know any anybody anything that's becoming available anybody that works in this industry that I'm maybe interested in or in this type yeah. of role it's you know like it again unfortunately we do live in a world I think where it, it's sometimes who you know and I'm I'm definitely my career is completely um driven by that I was super lucky to meet somebody and, and they've helped me become uh, you know take me to the place I am now but, you know, use your the people you know, because I say I, I think most people want to help and they certainly yeah. want to help people to kind of particularly that first step uh, yeah. onto the kind of career ladder. because It's a really difficult one. Yeah. And I think all it needs is an introduction. Um, you know, yeah. somebody gave you an introduction or an entry point, but you did the work. You know, you've got yourself to where you are now um but i think it does and we'll talk about this yeah. in a moment but it does touch on the importance of m mentors and role models and how they can help us um on our yes, journeys definitely. yeah um when you look back at your career so far you know what stands out as the highlight for you oh that's such a tricky question because so i think i've had quite a few i've had come some low points to work is uh, you know i would say it's not called work for nothing it's challenging it's <laughs> Good hard point. it's you know it, it, it's not always um it's not always easy that's for sure but I think I've had quite a lot you know I've, I, I've been given some good opportunities to work on things where I've been able to and again I think uh, this is something that I, I always see as a really positive if I'm building a team or I want to work with somebody is taking the initiative I think I've been given opportunities to be able to take that initiative and therefore yeah. sort of work on things and perhaps take more of a leading role, even if that wasn't necessarily what the plan was originally. And I think um, that's that's kind of uh, where I've enjoyed things the most. Yeah. Where I feel like I've been able to be like, oh well, I think I think this is a really good idea. I think we could maybe do it that way. What, what do people think? Yeah. And, when they then take that as a yeah sounds good and you can go with it I always yeah. think that's always something that feels really uh it, it, it it's always a bit of a, a highlight and, and you feel like oh yes somebody's somebody's taking what I think and, and letting me run with it and yeah I'm trying to think of a specific I don't really feel like I have one that's particular okay. so my last year that I I touched upon where it was such a challenge but actually you know ended up delivering on something that we set out to do it was the best and the worst almost. Yeah. It was, you know, the end of it, I was so proud of myself and it, I really felt like I'd achieved something that I didn't know I could. Yeah. But it was, it was tough to get there. <laughs> but you did. <laughs> I did. I, say, I met really great people um, on the way and um, yeah. I've got ma made some friends and, and some from colleagues from that who I really want to work with again. So again, it's, yeah. you know, the, trying to work on things in the best way you can so that you get to know different people because that's how you expand your network and that's how you might potentially be recommended for something or you might recommend somebody for yeah. something in the future as well which is always a nice place to be too absolutely and again when you look back on the career journey so far what's been the biggest challenge that you've had to overcome my biggest challenge was definitely the 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 acquisition merger of the two companies um, yeah. coming together where I currently work. I worked for one and they were acquired by another. Yeah. And it is, I think most people who might've been through something like that would say it's challenging. It 
it can be unstable for a very long time. You're not necessarily confident in your, your position in the company. Often it involves people perhaps uh, being made redundant. But I think going through something like that makes you learn that most of the time it isn't about you. It's about the business. And I think quite a important lesson to learn is that the company do care about you and they do want the best for you. And there's always benefits and things to, to, to ensure that you're safe and well as, a, as an employee. But ultimately, it is a business and they generally need to, whether even if it's things that you wouldn't necessarily consider a, a business, the NHS, it, it's still got to be able yeah. to make money to do the things that they need to do. And so it's very rarely personal. So just kind of uh, don't take it to heart too much. But that's such a difficult thing to tell people because it, it you know, it, it, it's a big thing to have to go to. I, I've been through redundancy. It's really challenging. But I think mergers and acquisitions are, that, that's that been the biggest challenge for me. It, it, it involves um, often people not necessarily happy, happy with the changes that are being made. Perhaps they'll leave, that leaves gaps in knowledge in one place or another. And it's it can be tough. And I think anything where there's too much change too quickly, it mm. is, 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 is very hard. Yeah. But... I've got really good leaders and, and senior team members in the team I work in. And, you know, they just continuously tell us that change is good. And it is. It's hard. And you might not always like the change. Yeah. But as long as you aren't completely reluctant to it forever and try and at least go with it, you'll probably end up finding yourself in a, in a half-decent position or even better when, yeah. when you come out the other side. But yeah, it sometimes takes time to realise that and to say it's it's never never easy going through huge huge amounts of change when you're when you're in a, a, a work environment but try and embrace it and as I say if things don't necessarily go the way you want them to it's probably not anything personal towards you it's just circumstance or things have changed so I think it's resilience is is important but um it, yeah. yeah it's, it's not, very rarely when it comes to work are things personal yeah yeah, absolutely. And for somebody who isn't familiar, um, when an organisation is acquired, it often means that there's a duplication of roles, right? And so, you know, like yes. you said, there could be a redundancy situation or or like you say, people are unhappy with the change and decide to leave. Or I'm, I'm guessing, you, you know, with a merger, there's merging of websites and things. So that can impact people's workloads and and uh, and then I think exactly. there's also there's also something um, called survivor syndrome. So when um, people leave an organisation, those that are left behind can often feel um, quite unsettled and guilty almost. So there's so many different emotions that happen when there is a big merger or acquisition or a big change. And and like you you say, I think it's important to you know try and embrace the change you know, think of it as an opportunity rather than a negative, talk to people and your leaders, be resilient as, a, you know, but, you know, talk to people and get the help where you need it. And, and know, like you say, know that it exactly. isn't personal, you know, it's a business decision and it's, you know, it's very rarely personal. Yeah, exactly. I say the talking thing is so important. I think if I'm speaking from experience, if you, you keep everything to yourself and it, it weighs on your shoulders and actually there's always people around you that have had experiences like this before potentially or just also uh, better at perhaps dealing with things than you are when it comes to certain situations you know I, I, I learned a lot during it to say one of the key things is often go up and, and and it's a very flat structure where I work and you can you can talk to anyone and everyone is, is super helpful it's it's everyone's ideas are important but you know people who've experienced these things often have really good advice to give you that make you just feel yeah. like ah that's such a weight off my shoulders because now I understand why I'm feeling like this or yeah uh, why I found that such a challenge and so I think companies now are so much more in a really positive way concerned about people's well-being yeah and they don't want you to be extremely stressed they don't want you to be upset or angry about things because ultimately that doesn't necessarily well it, de it definitely doesn't uh create a workforce who are going to be passionate or uh, yeah. effective and efficient and all those things so i think talk 
talk to people talk to the people who maybe have experienced it talk up to people who yeah perhaps um have had different experiences more experiences than you and it will almost certainly be helpful grace tell us about the role of mentors and role models and sponsors on your journey and how they might have helped you along the way um, I've had a couple of mentors during my career and I've also had people who I've just kind of taken on as mentors. They wouldn't necessarily know or I've told them afterwards, but it's it's really helpful because I think, and, and there's ways, different ways you can do it. You can either be given a mentor and if you ask for one through somewhere like work, that's nearly always uh, something that can be made available to you if you're interested in. But say so I've often sort of taken on mentors myself of people who, I really respect that I've worked with and like the way they work, kind of feel like they they do things in the way that I might like to do them in the future if I ever got to that position. So kind of think it depends how you want to think of a mentor. So I've had a couple where um, they're actually organised mentors and you meet with them and talk about things. It's usually led by you as an individual and you kind of get them to give you guidance or help you with things that you feel that you're struggling with or you could be better at or you just need to kind of a sounding board uh, for an idea or for something that is challenging you say sometimes it's just an opportunity to just confidentially you know especially if it's a mentor program it'll always be confidential confidentially just moan because you're really having a hard time you don't necessarily want your boss to know or your kind of close team members but you just want somebody to share how you're feeling so you can get it off your chest and then they might be able to give you some kind of guidance on how you could change something or perhaps a solution to a problem you might have or any of those things or maybe they won't do anything you're just there to listen because you've had a hard day and you just want to talk about it and there's not always um well I've certainly found that you know, you can talk to friends, you can talk to partners, you can talk to family members, but if they don't work in the company you work for, they might even work in the same industry, but if they don't yeah. work in the company you work for, they don't understand the ins and outs, they don't understand the politics and yeah. who the characters are, what people's personalities are. So they just don't necessarily get it. So somebody mm-hmm. potentially who works with you that can be a mentor can be really helpful because they just get it. Yeah. But somebody outside that is also potentially really helpful because they don't get it. So they have a bit more of a subjective, uh, objective view, sorry. Yeah. Um, So I think it's, if if a mentor is always a really good thing to, you know, if, if, again, if that opportunity is made available to you or ask, it's, you'll always, um, you'll always find some kind of common ground with people as well. And it's kind of inspiring to see how people have, you know, got to where they are and the experiences they've had and, challenges they've had um you know and, and and why they're passionate about things that they do so I I have also taken on people as mentors and just decided they are in my head and just aspire to be like them sometimes yeah. too and again I think it's quite helpful to have a person a role model who you think they they work in the way I'd like to or yeah. I, I wish I was a bit more like them at this certain time and having that idea in your head can sometimes help you kind of just um navigate that and 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 perhaps check yourself if you do something and say we all make mistakes and we all say things we shouldn't necessarily say and you think oh what would if I could have done that again what would I do differently what would this person do who who I think is is a great team lead or a great you know um, manager or even just you know a great person in my team well how they would have dealt with that could I could I could I try and do it in that way next time and it's it's really helpful yeah Thank you. And I think that you raised something really important, especially for people who are just starting out on their career journeys. They might not have a formal mentor or an assigned mentor, but, you know, you can definitely look around the organization and think, yeah, I want to be like that. Or that person does this thing really great. I'm going to really observe that and watch how that person does it and emulate it. So absolutely. Thank you. All right. So for somebody thinking digital marketing manager, yes, I think this is a career that I would like to find out more about. Are there any um, specialists or special educations or trainings that you would, you know, recommend to someone who wants to get into this um, career? I'd say 
at school or for A levels or a university, if you think you want to do marketing, I'm sure when I was at school, there wasn't really certainly not the sick form I went to. There wasn't really anything. It was like business, business management was business studies was the only thing you could have done. And I just I don't even know what that means. Why would I do that? Um, but then probably now is definitely more kind of business orientated um, uh, courses studies a levels that you can do and i think that would be really helpful i think it would give a really good understanding of how a business works which is something mm -hmm. i again never understood budgeting the accounting side the marketing side the sales side all the different kind of things that are involved in running a business but again at university there'll be marketing courses digital marketing courses that you'll yeah. be able to do but i also don't think you need to do any of those things necessarily again if you're not quite sure going to university or finish university or not wanting to go to university at all there's um quite a lot of good resources online yeah. there's something called google garage which is um a free google um google led um so it's a set of courses actually but there's specifically a, a digital marketing one so it's free Brilliant. you get a certificate at the end of it it's 40 hours worth of um training and it gives you such a broad kind of understanding of digital marketing as as a as a role of, 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 of the different areas that are involved in it. And it's it's really good. And actually I've done it twice because I did it really early yeah. on in my career. And I did it again quite recently just because things change so fast. Mm. Um, so I'd really recommend that if somebody is interested in digital marketing. Um, but there's loads of podcasts out there as well. Like I listened to one um, which is called Digital Marketing Podcast. And it yeah. just keeps you up to date with all of those new things that are coming into play as we uh, you know have discussed earlier you know artificial intelligence chat gbt all the different social media platforms that are coming into play which um i as a person who's a bit older i'm just like oh gosh i should really get involved in tiktok or be real or all these things and you know it just keeps you up to date with all these things yeah. that are going on so uh, i think that's that's really helpful but say like it that's if helpful. it interests you, there's so much stuff you can go and find online and say it's um, Google is uh, as a not as a place to search, but Google as a as a company is a good yeah. place to start because they're generally at the forefront of all of these things. Yeah. And usually if, if they decide something's going to work in a certain way or this is a good part, of it, it's kind of what 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 happens. So okay. Google tools and, and, and Google training is a really good place to start if you haven't got any kind of um uh official training or or a levels or anything in, yeah. in the subject okay brilliant and what i'll do is we'll put some show links to those in the show notes because they sound brilliant thank you um yeah. grace what about softer skills so you know if you think about why you've excelled in this um area you know what what soft skills has it drawn upon and what might somebody might like to be thinking mm, have I got that or haven't I got that if they're going to do well in this area something that is so important to me and it's in this area but I think everybody who I've ever worked with is to try and be collaborative and work together as yeah. a team and it's I've been really lucky that everywhere I've worked has been quite a, a flat structure meaning that just because your boss says something it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right yeah. and I say I've been very lucky that that's that's always been the type of company I've worked in um so I think it's working collaboratively means that you you can have your opinion you might know best and feel safe that you can do that and that's something that I always really try and do as well that everybody and I say all the people who I've luckily worked with most of the time or certainly people who I've liked working with and have you know continue to potentially work with have been everybody's got a seat at the table everybody's voice is is valid and ultimately at the end of the day the person above you who's perhaps accountable yeah more than you are or you know I'm accountable for things now and but I want my team to share with me things ideas ways they think something might work better but ultimately I might be accountable or my boss is accountable so they might be able to say do you know what we actually have to do it this way for this reason yeah. But more two heads are better than one, five heads are better than, you know, three and all that kind of thing. So I think working collaboratively and yeah. making sure that you listen to what other people have to say is, yeah. is super helpful. But I think another thing that I like to think I 
do and again when I'm looking for people to be in my team or just uh, people who I uh, enjoy working with is people who are proactive and yeah. take initiative mm-hmm. you can always be a person who does the job exactly as is asked of you mm-hmm. but I don't think generally you'll end up progressing too far because I think you need to show if you see something that could be done better perhaps suggest that if you see yeah. a challenge or a problem try and come up with a solution and and suggest it to somebody again they might not take it or it might not be the right time to take it but I think people appreciate somebody coming up with a potential solution to a problem or a new idea to do something better and just because something's been done in a way for the last five ten years does not necessarily mean it's the right way to do it so I think proactivity is something that I think I'm pretty good at and it's always served me well and it's something that I really value in in people I work with as well but yeah being collaborative yeah. is is um also key so I don't think anybody knows everything and, no. and and definitely more ideas to a certain degree you don't always want 50 heads when it could be 10 but you yeah. know it, it idea sharing is always good yeah, thank you. And the other her- things that I heard you talk about through the conversation were things like resilience, um, being able to, to um, talk to people, and I guess I guess uh, push back when people are wanting things. Uh, you know, yesterday, as well as being able to, uh, I guess, c- problem solve and 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 come up with creative solutions. So um, I heard those things as well, which sound like they'd be super useful. Yeah, I think the ability to say no is um, a real powerful thing. And it's actually one of my personal objectives for the year because I'm a person who will, it takes quite a lot for me to say no to something. And it's usually because I have determined that it probably can't, shouldn't, not the best approach. Yeah. And then sometimes somebody will be able to, uh, negotiate with me on why or or decide that maybe we should be doing this and sticking to your guns if you've got to that point where you're saying no is is a very um sometimes can be a really good thing particularly for your own yeah for your own um well-being and helps build that resilience and stuff as well like again sometimes that decision will be taken out of your hands and people come to say i know you said no but actually we need to but generally if if you've kind of thought about it and try and balanced out the pros and cons and you've decided to say no it's a it's a good place to be and it's probably for the right reasons and yeah it will probably help you with your yeah. how, how your your ability and uh, to kind of cope with workload and all that kind of stuff yeah and like you said earlier it's um if you're saying yes to one person that means you're saying no to something else and I guess it's always trying to think about, um, you know, what are we trying to achieve as an organisation, as a department, as a team? Is that ask aligned with those objectives? If yes, great. If no, 100%. not right now. Exactly. <laughs> and I think that's always a key thing to have in mind that there are business objectives, there are team objectives, there's individual objectives. And if those things aren't aligned, then if you said yes to everything, it just it can be chaos to be honest yeah. and say there's there's reasons why a company has a sort of strategic vision say a team and everything because they've been determined are the things that are actually the most worthwhile things to work on to achieve that so trying yeah. to stick to that as much as you can is is also a um, beneficial it's not always easy and sometimes you don't people's strategy or the sort of objectives aren't necessarily clear but I think always ask that question as well what's what we're trying to achieve here and that's always a good question to ask I think yeah thank you well we've touched on um, resources for people who want to find out more and we've also touched on the future of digital marketing which is wonderful um I'm really curious Grace about what you wish you had known when you were just starting out that you know now oh that's a good one I wish I had known that not knowing what you want to do isn't necessarily a problem. I think when I was younger, I was very stressed at certain points about the fact that I didn't know where my career was going or is this the right move? Is this, you know, is this the correct thing to be doing? And I say it kind of has all worked out. Probably I would have never in a million years said I would be 
working in asset management because I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I don't really have or never really have had like that much of a super interest in kind of investing. I, I do invest my money because it's a really sensible thing to do, but I don't necessarily know the ins and outs in it. I don't check my investment performance every day. I don't go out of my way to search for new companies to invest in. I kind of I'm quite, you know, I'll invest in, I'll invest in things, but um, it, it's kind of based on knowledge I've learned along the way, but not, not a huge amount of it. <laughs> um, but it's that things will work out if they take those opportunities. And I just, I, I've ended up here without having any kind of plan at the beginning and, and it, it's turned out okay. And you can always change direction. I think yeah. sometimes it is tough if life gets in the way of things, you know, so you do need to pay your bills you you do need to earn money but it doesn't mean opportunities aren't going to come up as say like i um i took uh the this sort of design team secondment not knowing anything about it i was lucky yeah. that i got to stay on the same salary as i was on previously <laughs> and that's a benefit sometimes of moving internally within a company because they'll often keep you in that kind of a same salary as you you already have not always but i think uh potentially sort of moving around within a company that where you're known is super yeah. helpful. And again, I never really knew that was a thing you could do. Like yeah. that if you got given a job, that was the job you did and you might get promoted. But I never really thought about sidewards movements of taking a different opportunity within a company or within even your team and giving it a go. And I think that's something that, you know, if I had known, I might have taken a bit more of an opportunity to do it uh, earlier in my career, yeah. but it definitely helped me. So I think, yeah, being aware of sidewards movements, taking opportunities in different teams. But yeah, it's, um, I think it's okay to not know. Yeah. Is I think what I've learned. It's okay to not be sure. It's okay to to try things and, and it'll hopefully work out. And if it doesn't, change direction again it'll yeah. it'll be fine so we do need to pay our bills so it, it's tough if you completely want to change direction and 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 perhaps take a, a a role where you might have to take a salary cut but again if you feel passionately about it it's probably worth yeah. doing and yeah and you can start that again and, and and you'll you know get there get there in the end so it's about finding things that you're interested in absolutely grace what is inspiring you right now Apart from this conversation, obviously. <laughs> of course. Um, these type of things are inspiring, though, because it makes me remember why I kind of like doing what I'm doing. But what's inspiring right now? I was very inspired recently having an intern in the team and how excited she was yeah. about potentially starting work. And again, she she was somebody who had come in and spoken to lots of different parts of the business and then requested to come and be an intern in... Um, in the, the digital marketing team specifically for the website and social media and that was inspiring for me because it was like oh yeah what we do is interesting yeah. even an 18 year old girl who doesn't really know necessarily what she wants to do finds what we do exciting and potentially something that might interest her and that was like oh yeah okay that's uh that's nice for me to know but I think for me I've got a super inspiring um a senior leadership team who yeah drive us to work very hard in a good way but yeah. to be the best we possibly can be yeah. and not to the point where the expectations are above what we could you know but it is the best you can be and that's always yeah. an inspiring thing for me and they do believe in us and they kind of give us the tools to make sure that that, that we can kind of uh, do things to the to the best of our ability so I think that's what's inspiring me at the moment to leaders who uh who kind of give us all the opportunities to do what we yeah. do as best we possibly can and um and and the opportunity to work on new things that we might not yeah. necessarily have worked on before thank you grace i love to um i love a quote so do you have any quotes or inspirational expressions or mantras that you'd like to share with the audience do you know what is i think this is probably not it's probably a really boring one but it's one i use a lot at work but i don't think it's not like it's a quote that i learned from a previous head of marketing i worked for um and it's don't do five things averagely do three things really well and it's don't try and take on too much because inevitably yeah. you probably will do each of those things okay and that's fine but they probably then won't 
perform in the way you wanted to do or have the impact you wanted them to do three of those things out of a list of five and make sure that the ones that you do do are well planned out well thought out that the time has been taken that it deserves the resource has been given to it that it deserves and it will probably mean that it's yeah the result is is far more positive and that I think makes everybody feel better and feel more passionate than oh yeah that was all right move on to the next thing but yeah. so I don't think that's probably not a particularly exciting one but it's one that I really live by and yeah. um and and say it to people a lot as well yeah it's really good advice thank you all right Grace, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate your time. And I'm wondering if there's anything that you would like to leave the audience with, any final words of wisdom or encouragement? Um, I think try any opportunities that come to you, if you feel ready for them. Um, Don't give yourself a hard time if things don't necessarily work out exactly how you thought they might. I don't think there's many people who they do even if somebody thinks they've got their dream job there's probably reasons why it 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 isn't necessarily and just yeah dive in head first where you can and ask people chat to people talk to people if you need help or if you need an opportunity and I'm sure people would be more than willing to help I know that's that's how I feel about things brilliant okay thank you so Thank you so much for joining Grace and I today. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you found any value in today's episode, please help us out by sharing with some friends and subscribing to the channel. And if you have any questions, comments or suggestions, get in touch. We love hearing from you. So have a great week and we will see you next time. Thanks so much.